Yo, 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 if you're just tuning into the channel, this is your boy, Six Gear Cutlow. And I want to welcome everybody to the channel, man. This is the 22 Tracer 9 GT. I've been riding for about three years. First off, I want to give a shout out to all my subscribers from the ones from day one till now, man. I really appreciate y'all, uh, all the comments that you guys drop. I really appreciate those comments. That is what keeps me going. As you know, you know what I mean? We running the low to medium sized channel so we don't got a whole bunch of traffic. So the comments is the motivation and just the smallest comments like, yo, I like this video or I don't like this video. Those keep me motivated to keep making these videos. What I wanna do is uh, introduce you guys into a new segment that I'm running. It's gonna be called Boots on the Pavement. Now what this segment is gonna be about is basically me showing you guys some of the people that I've met through the past three years of riding. Um, One thing about having a motorcycle is once you get a motorcycle, you're immediately in this club of riders, whether you ride Harley, Harleys, sport touring, super sports, whatever it is that you ride in, you're immediately in a biker's club. And in this biker's club, I have met some amazing individuals. I've met people that can ride extremely well. I've met people that know damn near everything about motorcycles. Um, and I met people who share the same passion as I do. And with this Boots on the Pavement series, I wanna bring you guys close to some of those people that I've met, go to some of the shops in this area, uh, the people that have worked on my bike and who have taught me some of the knowledge about this stuff. One thing about these motorcycles, as you know, if you're on YouTube, it's like a bottomless pit of information and, and stuff that you can learn about the bike. And if you're passionate like I am, you want to learn as much and meet as many people and talk to as many people as you can. So on this first episode of Boots in the Pavement, we're going to go to my favorite shop currently. This is my favorite shop. This is where I get 90% of the work done. Um, everything from putting frame sliders on my bike to tunes and ECUs and all that stuff. Um, if you've been watching this channel, you've seen this shop on my channel plenty of times. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce you guys into some of the people up at Kaler Made uh, in Marietta, Georgia. I'll put the info somewhere on the screen so you guys can check them out. Um, one of the first people I'm gonna introduce you guys to is Opie Kaler. Now Opie Kaler is pretty much the manager of Kaler Made. He opened the shop and uh, he basically makes sure all the operations and everything go well. So I'm gonna interview him, I'm gonna interview uh, Q, and I'm gonna interview B up at Kaler May, but we're gonna start this episode with just the first interview on Boots in the Pavement, and this is gonna be with Opie Kaler at Kaler May. I hope y'all enjoy it. Leave some comments, call up to Kaler May, tell him you've seen the video. Appreciate y'all rocking with me. It's your boy Six. It's your boy Six Gear Cutlow. I'm here with Opie Kaler. This is the owner of the shop right here. Uh, we're gonna ask him a few questions about the shop, give y'all some background info so y'all know a little bit more about Kaler Made. Um, so the first question is, what got you into motorcycles? Wow. Um, you know, growing up as a kid, um, I had aunts and uncles that rode, and uh, my dad had a motorcycle for a little while. And uh, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to follow in the footsteps of your peers, do what they did, and uh, it interested me. Um, I like twisting the throttle, I like going fast, and uh, just enjoyed riding and, and enjoyed the freedom, you know, that it felt like, and uh, uh, it was great. It was just the whole experience was, was awesome, and every time I got on the bike, I uh, just got off the bike uh, feeling a little bit better, you know? I was like, yep. I wanna keep doing that. Yep, but you took it past just straight up riding. You went to going all the way in on a track professional racing and really doing it as a career. What got you into that? Uh, it, it was interesting, really. Uh, growing up, um, I lived sometimes in a, in a city type setting, and then other times I lived in more of like a, a country type setting. And so I kind of bounced back and forth between dirt bikes and uh, like BMX freestyle bikes yep. back in the 80s. And yep. So um, I, uh, out of high school, started college, 
I had a part-time job at a local car wash of all places, and there was a guy there who uh, had this beautiful 1991 uh, black and silver with purple wheels, uh, GSXR, like 1992 model GSXR 750. And uh, his name was Leron, and Leron was uh, telling us all, he'd gone down to hang out at Myrtle and came back and was talking about how awesome that was. And I'm like, man, you know, girls dig motorcycles. Yeah, I yeah, need a bike, yeah, fact, you know? Fact. And so uh, uh, I started looking into bikes and uh, seeing what I could come up with and what I could afford and whatnot. And so I ended up getting a bike. I got my, my first real street bike was a uh, Honda Interceptor 700. And so um, one day a buddy of mine was like, hey man, let's ride up to Deals Gap, the Dragon, you know? And I'm like, what's that? So I go up there and, and, and truth be told, I failed miserably at picking up girls on a motorcycle, that's for sure. But went up to the mountains, rode the uh, Deals Gap, the 318 turns, nine and a half miles. And I just thought, wow, that's what this, this thing is for. And so in the early nineties, there, you know, the, really the only way to get on the racetrack was to go racing. Um, but there was this new group uh, called Southeastern Sport Bike Association. And as far as I know, it was the first track day organization that ever existed. And we're talking like 92. Mm. Uh, and so, um, but this guy named Stan Dilcher, he owned it, you know, ran the whole deal and uh, did my first track day uh, at Talladega in Alabama. And then after I did that, that was probably 1990, I'm gonna say that was early 93. Once I went and did a track day, I'm like, wow, man. I mean, everything I wanted to go on fast, dragging your knee, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's corner workers in every corner. If you fall down and, and get beat up, you know, they, people right there to help you. There's ambulances ready. Yeah. Worst case scenario, there's a helicopter waiting, yeah, you know? And I just thought, man, every way I want to push myself and my motorcycle on the racetrack is illegal. And instead of getting, or excuse me, is, is legal. And instead of getting chased, people are clapping for us, you, you know? Go and all so, the way in. Yeah, yeah. they just, after that, man, I, I, I met a couple of guys along the way that kind of, you know, gave me some direction and gave me a clear path on how to how to do it um, and how to do it right. And uh, I just started focusing on that. Nice, nice. And then that eventually led to, I'm guessing, Kaylor Made. How did how did how did you come up with the idea of this is what I want to do? I want to have a shop, work on bikes. Um, coming from just riding to doing this, like, sure. how did how did Kaylor May get started? How long it's been in business? So funny enough, I was actually I, I grew up as a mechanic uh, or in a mechanic's house with my dad. He was a, a jet engine mechanic in yep. the U.S. Navy, and so uh, I had a little dirt bike when I was a kid, a Honda XR75, and I ended up blowing it up. And so we didn't have the money to have the motor rebuilt or buy a new bike, and so um, we got a you know an owner's or a service manual for the bike. And he kind of guided me through it. And so I actually rebuilt my first engine at 13 mm. on that little XR or XR75. 13. 13 years old, I built my first motor. And so um, I've always been, I guess, mechanical. And I actually was, was a certified Honda and Suzuki mechanic before I ever actually raced. And so um, I knew at some point, you know, you can't race forever. We get right. older, um, you know, your reaction times, all that stuff falls off. So I needed a, you know, a good plan B. I needed a backup plan. And so I went with racing as long as I could. I made it to the AMA. I raced five full years of uh, full-on AMA pro racing. And then uh, when I retired from that uh, in 2008, I decided, well, I still like racing. I still like going fast. I'm going to go club race, chase some money, chase some contingency winnings. And, but at the same time, open up a place that I want to make my own. And so that, that was how Kayla made evolved was started off. It was me in a building. I've had years of experience, both at a dealership. Um, but there are things that the racetrack teach you that, that no school is going to teach you as a mechanic. And yeah. so I just tried to blend that and, um, create a place where it's cool to hang out. We know what we're doing. Definitely. It's fun to, fun to work on bikes, fun to be around bikes. And I love bikes and I love people. So it's just, it was natural. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that, uh, that I really wanted to come to the shop was because you've had so much experience on the track with the real deal people who really do it. And the same thing, like you said, it's just some of that stuff that they can't teach you that, that comes in handy when you're getting your bike fixed or whatever you're, you're getting done to it. So yep. yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. So, uh, so where do your hours of operation up here? So, Tuesday through Friday. Tuesday through Friday. We're 10 till 6. Yep. Uh, Saturday's 10 till 2. Saturdays are typically just kind of a pick up and drop off day. We don't typically do a lot of work that day. Um, so, we, we kind of cater that towards, you know, bikes coming in, bikes going out. 
Uh, a lot of that stuff takes place on Saturdays. Yep. Um, so you do uh, do special events on Saturdays. Absolutely. Like that, the Dino Day. Yes, absolutely. So, um, your last couple of years, we've done Dino Days on specific Saturdays. We got one coming up, I think, the first Saturday of May this year. Um, uh, I hope I didn't let the cat out of the bag with that. But uh, that's the plan right now. Uh, Dino Day this year. Yeah, yeah. I think Dude Monk has said something about okay. it uh, okay. already. So, it's out there. And yep. so, looking forward to that. Uh, occasionally, we'll gather up. Uh, you know, a handful of customers who also do track days, and we'll go do a track day together, typically on a Saturday. Uh, we've actually got one coming up um, on March 29, no, March 30th. It's a Saturday, so the shop will be closed Saturday, March 30th, because we're all going to be out twisting that throttle. Now, the track, we love the track, yep. but one of the inevitable things that happens at the track is people wreck. I've been up here. I've been coming to Kaler May for about three years and I've seen some bikes come in here that just look like they can't be saved and I've seen you guys save them so typically what is the process of taking a really wrecked bike and getting it back on so we don't have everything we need under one roof right but one of the beauties of, of being in Atlanta and being in this area is that pretty much everything we need to do I mean, from the most basic thing to the most difficult thing, um, we can handle within one hour of, of where we're at. So typical worst case scenario is, let's say somebody cartwheels a bike, thing goes flipping end to end. Mm -hmm. um, the frame can sometimes get tucked and pushed in, and all of a sudden you'll see that your front wheel is closer to your bodywork or closer to your exhaust than it should be. So literally the frame has been pushed inward by landing on the front tire with a lot of force. And so there's a company that has been around for many, many years. Um, you know, if that's your baby and you don't want to let it go, uh, this company can actually take, measure the bike out, plot all the points of what the geometry should be, and then through this measuring system, actually take, uh, find out where it's supposed to be based on where it was from the factory. And then I can actually heat the frame and straighten and pull the frame back out so that your rake and trail numbers are where they need to be. Mm, I uh, didn't know that. Absolutely. So frames... You know, a frame, number one, is super expensive. Um, and number two, um, you gotta deal with the VIN number thing. If you replace a frame, you typically what you gotta do is is transfer that number from the VIN number of the original bike over to the new frame, then cut the headstock off of that frame and send it back to the manufacturer. That is the correct way to do that. Manufacturers, Honda, Suzuki, Yamaha, Kawasaki, they do not want multiple VIN numbers you know, uh, uh, have two different frames and two different VIN numbers on the street. So uh, that's, that's probably why it costs so much to do that. Absolutely. So Sheesh. let's say you go crash the thing, it gets bent up, you bring it to Kaler Made. Uh, we're going to do some basic measurements, some visual inspections. And at that point, we can say, okay, we're going to tear this thing all the way down to the frame, motor, and wheels, just make it a roller. And at that point, decide whether or not it needs frame straightening service or maybe it's got some bent forks or twisted triples and there, you know, based on what we see there, we come up with a game plan how to move forward. Nice, nice, nice. So, so like just, 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 just like a minor, well not minor, but, but let's say fairings, mm -hmm. right? Like we go to the track, we scrape the bike up. Sure. Just fairings and a brake lever. Like that's a common issue that you might see, right? Like, Easy like, stuff. Oh yeah, it's a little tip over. I like to call them tip overs. So that's probably about like maybe like depending on how busy you guys are, you can probably get that fixed up in, in about how long? You know, something like that. that some of it, let's say you go with OEM plastics. Yep. Uh, some of it's going to be parts availability. Yeah, you got to order it. Right. And right. what we're finding is when those bikes start getting older than about seven or eight years, parts availability and prices, they start going up mm. um, because Basically, I think the manufacturers want to sell people new bikes, not necessarily fix all the old ones. Yeah. You know, and yeah, so yeah. I, I... Yeah, it's, it's one of those things. Yeah, it's a balance. And yeah. so typically, though, something like that, man, we can... I mean, that's easy stuff. We can turn that around in, you know, a week or less if, if parts are available. Nice. Um, you know, and, and then two, you know, our crew here, um, one of the things I'm really proud of that this shop has... has uh, that the shop can bolster is that um, I have a gentleman that works here, Ed Eskew, who worked for Yamaha corporately for 22 years. Yeah. He worked for Suzuki for 14 years corporately. And then you have B. B and I have been working together well over 10 years. Yeah. Um, he has at least double that in experience. And then, uh, and myself, uh, this is my 33rd year as a professional 
uh, working on motorcycles and being around motorcycles. And so collectively, just between the three of us, not even counting Q, um, we, uh, we can bolster 100 years of actual uh, you know, tech experience, mechanic Knowledge experience. and experience, yup. Absolutely, and Real I'm, I'm proud of that, and I'm telling you, I, you know, I think it all comes down to how good your team is. Definitely. And I, I feel like TaylorMade has got the best team. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, so, so as far as services up here, you guys offer everything from like uh, first services, just oil changes all the way to tuning and stuff like that. Absolutely. One thing that I didn't know that you guys did up here is suspension tuning. Sure. You guys do that. Absolutely. You know, suspension tuning, uh, through all my years of racing, um, it's amazing what you can accomplish with making the suspension work right. And, and I was racing one time at a track in Indianapolis. It's called Indianapolis Raceway Park. And turn one there on a 750 was probably fourth gear, 130, 140 miles an hour. And there were these three huge bumps. And they were so big that when you would hit them at that speed, the bike would just kind of almost bounce like a boat. Yeah. And, and every time it kind of bounced and the, the, the tires deflected off the bumps, you would run wider and wider and wider mm. to the point you're almost running off in the grass at over 130 miles an hour. And so I just started thinking about my knowledge as a mechanic and then trying to understand fluid dynamics and how everything moves. And I really tried to figure out, you know, how can I, how can I come up with a way to counteract this to make the bumps go away? Right. Even though they're still there, I want to make them feel like they're not. And so um, I just started really thinking about how the bumps come up and impact your tire, not the other way around. And so when I started just kind of theorizing, I started saying, okay, let me make these changes. And um, I was racing and, and, and going fast, and um, but there were times the bike wasn't there. And so through, I guess, practical application, making changes, trying stuff. Sometimes you go backwards. I mean, I've, I've made mistakes with my setup <laughs> to the back. You know, right. it happens. Right. Um, but after That's years- That's why it's good to get a lot of that done, like at the track where you can absolutely. go out and test it a lap, come back and make some adjustments. And the key is one of the things that I'm really big on of, of all my years at the track is I keep one of them little black and white composition books. Yeah. And I take notes and I take notes every time I make a setting change. And if it worked, then I can build off of that. But if it didn't work, what that does is it provides me a walk path of the direction not to go. Yeah, that's a that's a nice little and I base that right there. I base that on lap times, and so once I see my lap times getting better, I'm like, okay, cool, things are working. Yeah, you know, and if your lap times start going slower, it's like, okay, I made a mistake, I got to go the whole other way. You know? Yeah, yeah, hell yeah, all good. Hey, well, y'all got a chance to meet Opie Kaler. Appreciate you. It's a pleasure, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, appreciate y'all checking that episode out. Once again, that's Opie Kaler up at Kaler May Marietta GA. They doing everything from putting frame sliders on your bike to giving you a hundred more horsepower. You know what I'm saying? So we got a couple new episodes coming up. We're gonna have B on there. We're gonna have Q on there on the next episode. Show y'all more of the Kaler May episode. Then we're gonna take the show on the road, meet some more people, get some more interviews and stuff like that. Long story short, we putting boots on the pavement, baby. I appreciate y'all rocking with me. Stay tuned for the next episode. I'm gone. Peace.